What's going on everybody, Mortem here, this time bringing you my review after 100% for Remnant 2, often described as Dark Souls with guns, while incorporating elements of ARPGs through some of its procedural generation mechanics. Alongside multiplayer co-op options, make it a really interesting game to dive into, but with that in mind, here at the beginning, I review games after 100% all the time to set me apart from other reviewers on the platform, and while that does include the achievements, it includes more than that as well. There's a video linked below explaining everything that I cover, and my Steam profile is linked below in public as well. That said, on the topic of achievements for this particular game, I am aware that the developer said it would take something like 400 plus hours to see everything thanks to all the secrets, and while that might be the case, I will say it took me about 55-60 hours to get all of the achievements for this game, and just that saw me running through every area about five or six times, at which point almost everything I saw was a repeat. So while I would say it's certainly possible to see things like a world rolling some one in a thousand percent chance to actually spawn some secret via the procedural generation, which could then be incorporated in a statement like that, that kind of thing isn't really going to add anything to a review. So again, having gone through all of these areas in excess of five, six times each, I'm just not really seeing anything new at this point, so I don't see a reason to delay this review for it. That said, also here towards the beginning of the video, I do need to inform people that I did do a sponsored video for the launch of this game, talking about what it had to offer. This video is not sponsored, nor would a review ever be, but it is important that you know I did do a sponsored video for this game previously, which is how I got slightly early access to it, just a little bit before the official early access period for the pre-orders launched, I believe. Though with that that in mind, let's actually dive into the rest of what this game actually has to offer and what you can expect from it. First up, with very new games, I like to talk a little bit about the performance of said title, and with this game having been out for a few days, I do know that some players have reported some performance issues though this doesn't appear to be incredibly widespread. On that note, I can really only talk about my own experience, and in my time with the game, it crashed exactly once, and occasionally the frame rate would drop, which only happened a handful of times. So beyond that, the game played pretty well for me, and it was a very smooth experience. Though, in fairness, I did play pretty minimal amounts of the multiplayer aspect of the game, which almost certainly had something to do with that. So if you're still thinking about buying this, I would certainly look over some some of the negative reviews this game has received, especially in terms of its performance, and see if you have hardware that is similar to what the people experiencing problems had, at least on PC. Moving on though, let's talk difficulty and character creation a little bit. The game does feature a limited character creation screen where you can customize the general look of a character. It's nothing too crazy in depth, so don't expect to make just any character you can think of, but you can customize the look of your character a little bit, though this is purely cosmetic. After after this, you'll be able to select your initial difficulty for your first run of the campaign. At the beginning, only Survivor, Veteran, and Nightmare will be unlocked, with Apocalypse only unlocking after you have beaten the game. However, it's worth a mention that you're meant to start the game on either Survivor or Veteran. Nightmare and Apocalypse are meant for people who have fully geared up characters who have a build in mind, and because of this, it's possible to change the difficulty pretty frequently as you play through the game's very various modes, which we'll discuss a little more in depth. However, in terms of what these difficulties actually change, it is mostly the damage the enemies do to you. They'll get a little bit of marginal health increase as you go as well, especially just the regular fodder enemies, but as you move up in tiers, mostly the damage they do to you increases dramatically, to the point where on Nightmare and Apocalypse, you'll start getting killed in just a couple of hits to even just being one-shot by a boss, potentially. Bosses, in particular on those higher difficulties have vastly increased health pools, which is why you need the dedicated build to really tackle that without a huge headache. But keep in mind the difficulty is meant to be variable and there's no real problem with jumping around there a lot. Though that brings us to our story setup. The story of Remnant 2 follows, of course, the story of the first game, Remnant from the Ashes. However, here we are about 20 years or so later, and it is very much so a sort of direct sequel. You're going to meet a lot of returning characters. The events of the first game have an effect on the events of this game, and while you don't need to play the first game to really understand what's going on, it will certainly be helpful. So with that in mind, it's hard to talk about this game's story 
without somewhat spoiling the first, so you've been warned. Following the events of the first game, in which the character we played there put a stop to the root spreading on Earth. The root is a sort of corruption that is spreading and devouring the world, which put it in a post-apocalyptic state. However, it was not just our world. It was the many worlds of the universe, so to speak, because through a magical crystal of sorts called the World Stone, we traveled to other worlds also dealing with the root in our efforts to put a stop to it. And in the first game, we managed to do just that. However, obviously, in the second title here, it has re-emerged to be more of a problem. However, on Earth, things have gone relatively well. Following what was the last remnants of humanity, in Remnant 2, we see that Earth has sort of rebounded a bit. Things are looking up, people are coming together, civilization has started pulling itself back together. However, shortly upon finding a world stone with our new character, we learn that 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 might not necessarily be the case everywhere because the root is still using its minions to spread corruption and death on other worlds, and it is our job to put a stop to that. Now, that's as much as I want to say story setup wise, but I do have some general thoughts and things to know about it. Over the course of the game, we'll be exploring various worlds, which each have their own story. However, this game focuses much more on the story of the world you travel to than the overarching narrative, and because of that, each of the three worlds you travel to to actually has one of two different stories to tell you, which will then end in its own unique world boss and can, of course, have various outcomes as well, depending on how you approach them. So just right away, as a result of that, the order in which you tackle these worlds, which is nonlinear, on top of the story those worlds can tell you is variable. It's very easy to go through this game multiple times and have a slightly different experience each time. And while there are points in the narrative that are sort of set in stone, such as the ending in an area called the Labyrinth, there's also a ton of procedural generation at work, which all feeds into the main narrative. Now, on that note, I will say I found the ending pretty disappointing. They set up all this stuff, and then at the end of the game, the ending left me pretty unsatisfied. I don't want to spoil it for anybody, obviously, and while that kind of thing isn't necessarily what a game like this is all about, I will say the ending was not good for me. <laughs> but the stories and the worlds they built for them were pretty cool, and I enjoyed those quite a bit. That brings us to our progression systems, however. However, because ultimately, with this being Dark Souls with guns, or a looter shooter, or a game with ARPG elements, however you would like to describe it, a lot of it is about taking our character, forming a build with them, and fighting all sorts of enemies such as bosses or regular monsters with them. So with that in mind, there's a fair bit of progression. However, this starts with our archetypes. Right after the game's relatively short tutorial, you'll get to choose your first archetype, which is one of a few. This is going to give you a starting point for your character. However, it is not final. The archetypes you don't pick here can later be purchased from vendors around the main hub area. However, there are also several hidden archetypes, such as the engineer, the alchemist, the summoner, some of the cooler stuff you might want to get to. And what's more, after you level up your first archetype to its maximum of 10, you can then equip a second one as a secondary archetype, allowing you to mix and match these a little bit. Archetypes make up sort of the main point of focus for a build you might do, and they do this through a variety of means. First of all, it does matter which one is your primary and secondary archetype, because you get the prime perk from your primary archetype which is a substantial buff to how you play the game in some way, such as the Handler's Dog Companion being able to revive you once per roughly minute and a half should you die which is pretty useful if you are not playing in co-op. But that's not something I would get if the handler archetype was not in the primary slot. Beyond that, each one also has a trait associated with it. And if you level the archetype all the way up to 10, that trait becomes permanent and you can use it even if you're not using that archetype anymore. And this gives you a potential reason to level up archetypes you don't plan on using at all. However, these also come with a variety of other abilities. For starters, our skills. We can equip one of three skills for both of our primary and secondary archetypes. These skills are pretty useful, obviously. You use them in combat. They can be actively damaging things, passive buffs, and a lot of things in between. These are going to vary a great deal depending on what you have equipped, of course, but it adds a slightly more active element to what has effectively replaced a sort of class system. We also get a lot of passive perks by leveling these up as well, all of which can be very useful, as they are going to form the bulk of our builds. And while that's a pretty cool system, we still have a variety of other 
to talk about, such as the traits that I mentioned. Much like the first game, rather than stats and things that we increase as we level up, these have been replaced with traits. Traits will do things like increase your health, stamina, how fast you recover your mod abilities, which we'll talk about, damage reduction, all sorts of things. Now, the trait system was something I really liked from the first game because it sort of addresses the problem with diminishing returns you get from typical Souls-likes and their leveling systems. However, I will say that they implemented a trait cap of 60, which means you can only put 60 points into the various traits, and I think that is incredibly limiting compared to the previous game's cap of, I think it was like 700 total. Especially when you keep in mind that even the sort of core base traits that everyone is going to want, like extra health and stamina, also count against this cap. And while your archetype will give you some traits for free, including your archetype trait that increases in power as you level up independently of the traits you find, still makes for a pretty limiting system. I really wish they had increased the cap here by like maybe 20 or so, because that would have been more rewarding. Though there are still a few things to know here. For starters, they've reduced the level cap of traits from 20 to 10 here in the sequel, and there are less but more meaningful traits overall. The first game could get a little too specific with these, with some of them just increasing the speed at which you vaulted over something, which compared to a trait that increases your fire rate is a no-brainer. So there's less traits overall, they are more impactful, but I think the cap really gets in the way of having fun with these traits, and I wish they would have either separated out the core traits and made them not count against the cap, or simply increased that cap at a base level, because that would have been more interesting. It always felt like I was like 20 or 30 trait points away from doing something really fun, which is unfortunate. Though, as a mention here, you don't really level up your character in Remnant 2 like you did in the first game, so the only way to increase trait points is by earning them from defeating certain bosses or finding tomes of knowledge out in the world. Once you hit the cap though, this stops benefiting you at all. You'll You'll still find tomes of knowledge and the like, and you'll even get trait points from defeating bosses, but they are effectively useless at that point. Moreover, you won't start the game with all of the traits, you'll only start with the core traits and the archetype traits you've got. You'll unlock more of these simply by playing the game, defeating certain bosses, completing certain events. So even here, you might not necessarily discover everything you want to use. Now the rest of progression comes from leveling up your gear and equipment, which naturally first involves finding it. There are a lot of secrets in this game. You can find secret equipment all over the place, so keep in mind where you get this equipment from is very much so part of the progression. But generally speaking, your gear is going to come down to your rings, amulets, and your armor. Rings and amulets you'll find all over the place. They provide various buffs. You can have four rings and an amulet. Pretty self-explanatory there. They did make some substantial changes to armor, though. In the first game, armor would grant you these big bonuses based on how many pieces of a set you had equipped, well that's been done away with. Armor still provides resistances to certain damage types and it has a weight associated with it which will affect how much you can dodge, but the perks of wearing an amount of armor from a set have been removed. It looks like that's mostly been offloaded to the archetypes, which means armor is much less impactful, especially on higher difficulties where no matter what you have equipped, bosses are going to destroy you if they hit you. Which means the main thing to keep in mind here really is how the weight of said armor is affecting your dodge. But then we have our weapons. We get two guns and a melee weapon. The guns can be a long arm or a side arm. That is to say a long gun like a sniper rifle or an automatic weapon or different sorts of rifles, that kind of thing. Whereas our side arm is, of course, shorter weapons like sawn off shotguns, pistols, that kind of thing. All of these weapons will already have a great deal of diversity in what they are capable love in terms of are they automatic, what is their fire rate, you can get grenade launchers, shotguns, sniper rifles. There's also various melee weapons which have their own unique effects. There are even some claw weapons you can get your hands on versus two-handed melee weapons or a quicker, more sword-oriented version. So there's a lot of weapons that you can play around with and using those weapons with your archetype and everything is going to create a ton of build diversity. But outside the type of weapon you're using, there are some important things to note which are 
are mods, mutators, and upgrades. Mods are effectively the power you can slot into each weapon. It is possible to find special weapons that have a set mod that cannot be changed, however, in most of the regular weapons you can change out whatever the mod power is, which will give you access to all sorts of abilities that have a sort of cooldown based on how much you are using that individual weapon. These can be all sorts of effects though, such as simply adding damage types to your weapons, or firing out large AoEs, changing the type of damage you deal for a time, or more dramatic effects depending on the bosses you're fighting. But new to this game, in addition to the mods though is mutators. Mutators are a second thing you can attach to various weapons that will have typically more passive effects. However, they can still be very, very substantial. To give an example of what was my favorite one, we had the bandit mutator, which added a buff to a weapon that gave a percent chance on hit with a weapon to refund the ammo cost directly back into the weapon's magazine. And when combined with the gunslinger archetype that already gets faster fire rates, better reload times, alongside something like an automatic weapon, you can make a lot of use out of that mutator, which fully upgraded has like a 30% chance of refunding the ammo cost, just to give an example of how some of those things can interact. Though when it comes to weapons, both mutators and the weapons themselves can be upgraded. You're going to pick up various crafting materials which have all sorts of uses, one of which is upgrading your weapons and mutators. Your character's power level is determined by how upgraded these weapons that you have equipped are, which is what determines the general strength of enemies outside of the difficulty you are playing on. You can't upgrade armor anymore like you could previously, but you can upgrade your weapons and the mutators, which is very important to do, so don't forget it. So that brings us to the gameplay and world section. Outside of the more set in stone areas of the campaign and everything, there are essentially three explorable worlds to explore and discover things in. Each of them has a sort of unique biome, many of which are very, very cool. Like I mentioned, they can have their own unique stories, unique dungeons that pop up, so you can run through the same area quite a few times. So as a central setup to the game, if you will, you're going to be operating out of your central hub called World. 13, which is where all your vendors are, which is where you can buy things like upgrades, etc. And then you'll use the world stone to teleport to these other worlds so you can explore them. However, after you complete each world in the main campaign, you'll unlock adventure mode for that world, which means in terms of gameplay modes, we essentially have the campaign mode as well as adventure mode. Campaign is, of course, the base story, though adventure mode is set to just one world in particular. This is important because at the world stone in the main hub, you can re-roll either the campaign or your adventure mode. Rerolling the campaign allows you to effectively start it over on a different difficulty or something, whereas adventure mode allows you to target specific things you might be looking for, such as a particular weapon type or a particular mod or trait, etc. This is also a great way to see other parts of a world you might want to explore more without just outright rerolling the campaign altogether. It's also worth a mention, though, that the adventure mode in Remnant 2 is larger than the original games. The original game had an adventure mode that gave you a smaller instance of the world you were adventuring on. However, in Remnant 2 here, Adventure Mode will spawn a version of that world exactly the size it would be in the campaign, which means more dungeons and more bosses to fight, which can make it a little easier to find things without re-rolling a campaign constantly. However, I will say, in spite of the things they refined and improved in this way, I do kind of wish there was just more worlds to explore. Three's pretty small, and you're probably going to get tired of looking at those biomes pretty quick, especially when one of them is simply a repeat of one from the first game as well. So if there was one area of this game that really could have been improved, it's that there could have just been a lot more variety to the worlds you were running through in terms of their visual aesthetic. Because while there's tons of variety in those worlds, they absolutely start to look the same after a while. All of that, though, brings us to the combat section of this game. By and large, combat, as you would probably expect, is simply a tweaked version of the first game's already quite good combat. And just to give you an example of that, I wanted to start this section out by talking about the relic. In the first game, like a lot of Souls likes, you have a healing item, you have so many charges of it between whatever checkpoint the game uses, which in this case is the world stones. Using a checkpoint will restore your healing items, but also reset all the enemies in the area. Pretty standard stuff. Well, in Remnant 2, they shook that up a little bit by making your healing item part of a broader section of items called relics now. 
Your healing item is something you can equip. There are a variety of them to find, and they can provide different effects. Some of them don't heal you at all, which might not sound great, but if you remember on higher difficulties where you're just about going to get one shot anyway, you don't necessarily need an item to heal at that point. And these can do things like simply provide you defensive buffs, make you faster, alongside other interesting effects that can change up the gameplay. But they didn't even stop there, which was already pretty cool. Each individual relic can be slotted with relic fragments, which can then increase or change some of the effects a little bit, or simply add to them, to again help you customize those bonuses, which I thought was a pretty cool system. Ultimately though, as combat goes, this is, as people like to call it, Dark Souls with guns. Now on the lower difficulties, it really feels more like an action adventure, honestly, with Souls-like elements, as most of what you're doing is shooting through cannon fodder enemies while fighting the occasional boss. And a lot of what you get out of combat is going to come down to the types of weapons you have, the build you're using, the archetypes you like the most, which is going to come down a lot to personal preference. For instance, I started the game as a handler expecting to move into summoner, which I knew was in the game, so I thought having a dog companion and then moving into summoning would be something really cool. However, once I got summoner, I realized that some of that actually works off of just eating through your own health, which I didn't care for mechanically. So I wound up using handler and gunslinger to increase my fire rate with automatic weapons, alongside reload speed while the dog could revive me if I happened to die because that was my primary archetype. So that's just one example of many. As I mentioned, there's a summoner build you could play around with. The engineer class is able to set up turrets and things like that. There is a medic archetype, which will allow you to heal and play a more support-oriented role in, say, a group. And there's even archetypes that focus more on the melee weapon, though do keep in mind there are some enemies that are very difficult to kill with only melee, as they fly around and are just generally out of melee range. But in terms of combat and the way you can approach it with your builds, it was fun to see how the game started with a variety of archetypes and then opened up more and more combat options that you could refine and play around with as the game went on. Especially since a variety of bosses can be made more difficult or easy depending on the build you happen to be using. Which brings me to the bosses. Boss fights in this game felt more fair, I would say. Oftentimes when I lost to a boss in Remnant 2, it really did feel like it was my fault, even on the higher difficulties. I messed up a dodge roll. I wasn't paying attention to the environment and fell off a ledge or something. Thing. And that's important to mention because the first game's bosses had a tendency to just throw ads at you over and over as a mechanic, and the second game here did away with most of that. While some bosses absolutely have ads, they are much less in number, and because of this, the bosses themselves typically have bigger, more intimidating mechanics that are very important to be dodged, and it can be incredibly punishing when you don't. So the bosses in general feel better to fight against, I would say, they felt fair more than anything, which meant fighting most of them was a really good time. Outside of fighting one, your build might not necessarily have been suited for, so to speak. Though the last thing I want to talk about with combat is the addition of aberrations. As you're exploring and going through places, sometimes mini bosses or just enemies you find out in the world can be a version of them that they call aberrations. These are effectively champion-like enemies that are glowing red and have extra effects and modifiers they can bring to the battlefield. Shocking was probably the one I hated the most as I found it very difficult to dodge, but these can also be things like life stealing, extra health in general, more resistances, that type of stuff. These enemies are harder to kill, but they drop special items. Specifically, they drop corrupted crystals, which are what you need to upgrade your mutators, as opposed to the standard materials that were in the previous game and simply ported forward. But that's just one of the ways Remnant 2 changes the formula a little bit while keeping the core of it intact. So that's ultimately how I would describe Remnant 2's combat. It keeps the core of what worked for the first game while adding little refinements and changes that make it a more engaging experience, such as the aberrations, boss fights that feel challenging but fair as opposed to just annoying in some cases, which gets even more interesting when you start talking about the alternate kill rewards. Many of the bosses have an alternate kill method that provides a different reward, which can then lead to like different guns or different mods crafted from said materials, which gives you access to different stuff. So while I doubt any of these individual systems are really going to blow you away, if you liked the first game, this is mostly just a refinement of all those things, which was very enjoyable for me at least. Though
that does finally bring us to our Steam Deck section. This game officially has a verified rating on Steam Deck, which I am happy to vouch for. The game plays very well there. It has the things you would expect, controller support, cloud saves, etc. It will also optimize your settings for the Steam Deck, though I did find even with that you could get a bit of a rough frame rate if you didn't lower them a little farther which you can probably see on screen here to some degree, but ultimately the game plays very well on that particular platform. I will say that I personally have a very hard time aiming games like this on that platform, mostly due to the controller, as I'm definitely more of a mouse guy when it comes to aiming in these types of games, but it's certainly a game you could play on the go there, so that verified rating is pretty justified. With that said, we come to our positives and negatives, and then we will wrap this thing up. So on the positive side of things, Remnant 2 has great game gameplay much like the first game. They managed to retain a lot of that while at the same time refining and expanding upon systems that make that gameplay even more interesting. It looks like they listened to a lot of player feedback from the first game and made the necessary changes to drive that experience forward, which is great for a sequel, even if the game itself isn't necessarily going to blow you away with its innovation or anything. Combine that with all the secrets and things to discover, and you've got a game you could play for a significant amount of time and enjoy your time with it before you even start talking about things like multiplayer. However, in spite of that, there are a variety of negatives. I would say these are mostly minor things, at least by comparison. For starters, there is the cap on the traits. I really wish they would adjust that, though it is my understanding they have no plans to do so, but the trait cap just doesn't feel good. I wish they would either decouple that from your core traits, like your health and stamina increases that are literally called core traits, or they would just increase the cap a little bit. Either of those would work, but it always felt felt like I was like 20 or 30 points from the build I actually wanted to make, which got kind of annoying. And then we have changes to some of the gear, like the armor changes. It is a bit of a bummer they didn't add any effects to the armor because without that, it doesn't feel like there's a lot of reason to change your armor very often outside of just visual appearances or the dodge mechanic. But only certain armor even affects the dodge mechanic. And while armor also has resistances at the higher levels of gameplay on Nightmare and Apocalypse, there's a good chance you'd die in one hit anyway, so it doesn't really matter. And because of that, armor really doesn't feel impactful like it did in the first game at all. And then we have the only three worlds. This is something that might be addressed by DLC, which is what happened in the first game, but you can only go on adventure mode in three worlds. There's only three main worlds to explore for the story outside of the set stuff. And while the procedural generation and variety and all the dungeons that can spawn in and out of all that does definitely help alleviate that. Ultimately, I will say at about 40-ish hours into it, I was getting very tired of just looking at the same biomes over and over again. And it's probably the one part of this game I would say felt like a step back from the first because the first game had more biomes and interesting environments to explore, even if it didn't have quite the same amount of things to explore in those environments. But unless you plan on re-rolling adventure mode like 20 times or something, you're probably not going to see a lot of the variety they added to these new worlds. So that one might be a personal gripe, but it's just something I noticed and I didn't care much for, comparatively at least, though that does finally bring us to our conclusion. My conclusion for Remnant 2 is that it is a game that mostly refines everything that was great about the first game and then brings them forward a little bit. There are some things that I don't think it necessarily interpreted as well, such as the trait cap, but by and large, it's mostly just refinements of that first game's already great gameplay. And realistically, they've only got a few things that I think could be addressed in a patch or something if they should so choose. And for me, I would say the positives vastly outweigh the few negatives. So for the game's base price of $50, I think that's a pretty good deal. And while that amount will of course change via whatever region you're actually living in here in the US, for $50 you're getting a great game that improved upon the original while also having a ton of content to explore. So for me, it definitely gets a buy, though if you haven't picked it up yet, I would definitely pay attention to the system you are running and taking note of the systems people are having problems on, because barring that, I definitely think it's worth it. That said, that's going to do it for this video. I certainly hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it informative. By all means, let me know what you think about the video or the game down in the comment section below, which of course means to like, comment, subscribe, all that YouTube jazz. But regardless of any of that, truly, just thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate it. May you wander in wisdom and have an amazing day.